Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about the, the, the P.P. Simmons ministry, what it's about? Uh, because it, it gives the impression when you first stumble across the website that it's the work of one person. Uh, so the, the what's behind, I guess, really what's behind the P.P. Simmons name to start with? Is well, there a meaning to that? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a YouTube moniker. It's, it's something that stuck from the very beginning. The, 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 uh, the ministry itself was suggested by a millionaire businessman in Birmingham, Alabama, and he, he and, his, and the second person was a, a youth pastor in southern Florida, and right. uh, they are anonymous, they remain anonymous, uh, it was their idea for us to start the P.P. Simmons channel, and uh, Carl Gallus was brought in uh, immediately, and he's the voice that you hear on 90% on, uh, of the videos, he's the, the primary narrator. And uh, then we have, and he is a major contributor to uh, the vast majority of the political content. And uh, I contribute to uh, some of the spiritual. Now, I am a, I am a small businessman. I, I'm a hazardous chemicals expert in the transportation industry. And I'm a published author. I've written and published six books. And three of them are Bible studies. And so we, we, there, are, there, are a, there is a considerable expert. You know, Carl Gallops is a pastor of a large church in Florida. And, and uh, he's a published author on his own right. He's got a, a book coming out called The Magic Man in the Sky. I'm sure you'll like that name. But uh, that's coming out in, uh, in May, published by WorldNet Daily. So that ought to be a big hit for you guys. Absolutely. So, I mean, what's the, what's the subject matter of The Magic Man in the Sky? Well, it, uh, it uh, proves... It proves now, I know you guys are going to have an issue with what I'm about to say, but it does prove okay. the existence of God. And how, does it, how does it do that, though? That well, quite interesting. yeah, and it, it uses the Bible to, and, and, right. and, Carl, and this was written by Carl, and he uses the Bible to, to show that God himself has given a way for people to know that he exists and that the Bible is the word of God. And, and you know, that's all, I, so, I, I, go ahead. So it sounds to me from what you're saying that he's using the Bible to prove that God says what he says in the Bible. Well, so I know it, it, sounds like circular, circular. it sounds like circular reasoning. It does. Uh, yeah. But people will have to get the book. And I'm not here to promote Carl Gauss. I'm here yeah. as a representative of P.P. P. Simmons. And specifically, I believe that uh, the, the, uh, the purpose for my being here was specifically the topic of cannibalism. And, uh, because I wrote that, I take full responsibility for that. That is an excerpt. Uh, did you read that on my blog, by the way? We have we have read that. Yeah, I mean, we were going to come to that. We thought we'd you know let you do a little introduction. Sure. Tell us a bit about yourself. Start with that. Yeah. I mean, the, the cannibalism uh, blog post. So any listeners who, who want to check that out, that's at PP uh, Simmons, which is P P S I M M O N S dot blogspot dot com forward slash twenty eleven forward slash zero nine forward slash atheisms dash disturbing dash doctrines dash and .html, or just go to ppsimmons.blogspot.com uh, and search for uh, cannibalism, I guess, will probably bring it up. It was a post on the uh, September 11th, in fact, uh, of last year, uh, where Mike made some interesting statements about cannibalism. So, yeah, I mean, it was, that, was, that was when I first became aware of your work. Oh, I see, okay. Of P. P. Simmons group. Yeah. Well, just so, just, so, just so the people are aware, that, that uh, entire blog post uh, outlines five doctrines within the uh, religion of atheism, and we can talk about that further if you want. Uh, but okay, yeah. atheism is not a religion. Okay, well, that's fine, but, and we can talk about that some more, uh, and, and I appreciate that. Well, we've heard that said many times, and we, we are comfortably... Uh, it's true. We, we, uh, Susan, we comfortably uh, defend our position on that. I, I'm more than willing to go into how we do that. But I just wanted to point out that that blog post well, that, is in it. That, Sorry, Jim. That's a good place to start because obviously there's a great deal of difference between a belief and, and a religion. So how do you delineate between the two? Well, okay, uh, Jim, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Just, just to finish my, my point, that uh, blog post is an excerpt from my book, uh, The Atheists Are Wrong, uh, How Atheism Ruins Everything. And uh, so that's, that's where that comes from. That's why it, 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 uh, it, uh, it's important for people to get that book, to understand the entire context of the blog article. But uh, if, you, if, if we use, let's say we use a common dictionary, right? Let's say we use the dictionary that's available at dictionary.com, right? That, that's a dictionary that everyone can access. If you skip down to uh, dictionary definition number six, now, the way dictionaries work, and I'm sure you guys are all, uh, you, you, you people rather, are all uh, you know, in, 
intelligent people, and uh, you understand that dictionaries work by listing the most commonly used uh, definition for a word as the mo as number one, and then it goes down the okay. list. So number, number six. Which are we looking at? Well, number That's six. Well, if you go to uh, religion dictionary.com, okay. their their religion definition. If you okay. go down to number six, it basically covers the that you could you could make a religion out of golf if it becomes your primary interest in life you've made a religion out of it uh, religions don't necessarily have to invoke transcendental realities or you can make a religion out of dentistry and so many people have made a religion out of Christianity for example now I have spent uh, 22,000 hours studying the Bible at last count and I still have questions about things but one of the, th the answers I have is that God hates religion Religion is responsible for so many wars, and well, the vast majority of wars. Am I right? And uh, so the the uh, the the, uh, the position. People responsible for wars. I think I think when properly understood, anything which you define as a religion, you, you can basically use that blanket description to, to to define anything really. You know, you can say that being a musician is, is is a religion. I think it's a very broad definition of the word. I think what we're referring to when we say that atheism is pretty much a useless term now, which we would agree with. Is that because it encourages people to line up behind a, a set of pre-subscribed ideas, um, which don't necessarily uh, celebrate the individual, let's say, which, which is why I choose to describe myself as a secular humanist rather than an atheist, because sure. atheism has become this dirty word, particularly in American politics, which is synonymous with nihilism and, and, and sort of not being interested when, in, in reality, the vast majority of atheists, quote-unquote, are people who are very interested in material reality and understanding things for what they really are or what they might want to believe that they are. So atheism is a useless term in our regard for as long as we define ourselves by the religious word for what we are. All right, and so well, getting back to the, and, and, I, and I understand what you're saying there, Jim, and, and, and I appreciate what you're saying, but getting back to the definition of, of, of atheism as a religion, you know, uh, a little more background about myself, I was an atheist until I was 27. And okay. until until then, I was I was what you would call a pr sorry. Go ahead. Just, because that's quite a thing to say. We, we hear it a lot, and, and it's, it's good to pick it apart sometimes. Okay. What would you What would you say? Why would you describe yourself as an atheist previous to being a Christian? Well, I was I was what I would describe as a non-religious atheist. In other words, somebody who didn't care what other people thought about it. We didn't go into the the uh, academic circles and try to eradicate all the Muslims and Christian thought and theology. I just lived as a pragmatic atheist, somebody who lived their life as though God did not exist. And uh, so to me, I was a non-religious atheist. But as soon as it's someone who believes that no transcendental realities exist, they take that and they make that their life, that it becomes their life's goal, just like the, the golfer who makes it their life to to their every living moment spent. What are you thinking of as being a transcendental reality? Well, that that now that gets down to the definition of real atheism, because now my book uh, does not serve the purpose of trying to prove the existence of God. Rather, it proves the indefensible position of atheism. Because you've all heard of the uh, TAG, right? Yeah. The transcendental argument for God. I believe that argument is dead. I believe that we oh, can... Absolutely, yeah. Yes. Uh, now, we, we would, we, I mean, we've spent, we've probably covered that in, I think total, the show's covered maybe about five or six hours with on, on the TA, on the tag. Uh, we, we would absolutely agree that that argument's dead. I mean, it's a complete non-starter. It's incredibly easy to pick apart. Yeah. Well, thank you, and, 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 and we agree there, of course, and I, yeah. I, believe, I believe we would probably agree on many things. One is that, you know, the first off, that religion is evil. Second off, that the transcendental argument for God is dead. However, I, my my book makes the case for the. Go ahead, Jim. Sorry. People who don't behave very nicely, but you're throwing out all kinds of words here which have loaded connotations, and just assuming that we agree with you, and that's not necessarily the case. Well, I'm. I'm sorry, uh, Jim, uh, Jim. If I keep cutting you off, it's because I'm having trouble picking you up here. Uh, but. Um, yeah. One of the things we sort of got used to quite a while ago using Skype for this sort of thing is that occasionally that can happen. Don't worry about it. If you just, it will pick you up. We use software in the mix to, to make sure everybody can be heard. So don't worry about that. All right, all right. So, so my, so I, I take the, the transcendental thing to to another level. For for me, uh, I believe that I can. I've shown in my book that atheism is nothing more than 
uh, than the philosophy of naturalism, which is the belief that nothing exists apart from nature, that there are no transcendental realities. Do we agree? Yeah, I would agree that that was that is a, a that, that that reality is uh, all we've got is all that we've got. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, no matter how strange anything is, if it exists within the universe, which it can't not exist within the universe because there is nothing beyond it, uh, so there's no outside of the universe for anything to exist in, uh, then it exists within the natural universe and is bound by the physical laws of the universe that that we live in. Uh, so, I mean, no matter how bizarre the things we may find out about the reality we in. We're in, then none of them are transcendental, they're just reflections of reality. Uh, as I say, space is a big place and there may be very, very strange things out there, but they will be things that have developed naturally within a real physical universe. So, I mean, I'm not sure where you can kind of fit anything else into that. If the universe is everything and there's no space outside of it for there to be anything outside of it, then the supernatural can't, by definition, exist. Is, is my opinion on that. So, so you make the case that so you're making the case for the philosophy of naturalism that there's nothing that exists outside of nature, and that is so. So, so that's the that's the the line of attack that we take in the book. The atheists are wrong. That is the transcendental. Well, that's just a matter of fact. Well, okay, you say it's a matter of fact, and yet and yet uh, billions of people would disagree with you. Now, I'm not making the ad hominem case here. I'm simply stating that the philosophy of naturalism is indefensible by virtue of the, of the anecdotal evidence alone. And so we make the case for the transcendental argument against atheism. We don't make a case for the, the Christian God. We, have to, we, we are attempting to, to, uh, to provoke atheists, uh, naturalists, uh, skeptics to jettison the philosophy of, of naturalism and to embrace the the possibility that supernatural realities do exist and that is the case that the book makes. Right, but the problem that you immediately face there is that all you're really doing is re reascribing what definition of the word God that you really mean. What, what, what you're effectively doing is saying whatever we don't understand is God and what, what we do understand can be accounted for with physics and chemistry therefore you should abandon all of that and assign it to God as well. It, well no, it well, let's forget about let's forget about let's forget about the existence of God uh, for a moment, Jim, and let's em, let's uh, embrace now. Now, the, the book make, the, it goes into the arena of logic, and now, logically speaking, atheism is indefensible because it is the converse fallacy of accident. It's the same fallacy that says because I've never seen a black swan, no black swans exist. You know, it's the same it's the same uh, it's the same uh, argument that says that uh, because I've never been to Walmart. No, no, no. Sorry, We're see. not saying that no, absolutely no gods exist. We're just saying that we don't have any evidence for it. We're not saying, oh, well, because I've never seen one, it doesn't exist. Okay. I'm not. I've never discounted the possibility that there could be a god or gods, but there is absolutely no evidence that there are any. Well, there could so also so. Be a teapot circling the moon, but we can't prove that either. Yeah, I live in that teapot. <laughs> It, it, that atheism is by definition, of the, by the very nature of the word itself, is atheistic. It, it, it is a rejection of the theism, which states that it happens, that, that it claims to be able to prove that a specific god of a specific religion exists. We're not. We're saying that specific gods of specific religions do not exist; that they are self-refuting truth claims. But it, it is not a statement that says no gods could possibly exist. Well, we just we just established not even five minutes ago that, and we all agreed that atheism is the philosophy of naturalism that no transcendental realities exist. Transcendental, the word transcendental. I've got to stop you there, Mike. Go ahead. Out. Atheism is basically all it is is a lack of belief in gods. That's all it is. There's nothing else attached to it. I mean, there, there may be other things that uh, atheists agree on. Uh, about that, but naturalism isn't necessarily part of atheism. Uh, you could be completely non-naturalistic and still not believe in God. You could believe that all sorts of supernatural entities existed, but you, if you didn't believe in a God, you'd still be an atheist. Uh, so I think trying to say that atheism is equivalent to naturalism is, is a little bit uh, of a fallacy. I think they, they often go together, but they're not synonymous. Yeah, they're not the same thing. You can't swap one for the other, which it seems to me that there's a what you're doing is saying atheism equals naturalism, and then you're attacking naturalism. Or you're saying naturalism equals atheism, and then you're attacking atheism. Uh, and it's, it's a fallacy of equivocation, I think, is the right one. I don't mean to be, uh, con I don't mean to be contrarian here. I really don't. But in, in all honesty... 
would you not agree that modern atheism, now you're equating Buddhism in the, we can't throw Buddhism in here, which is, the, which is atheism with spirituality. Uh, let's, let's, go to the, let's go to the Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins atheism. Let's speak about that, because you guys are skeptics, and, that, and that basically, you know, I did listen to one of your podcasts, and, uh, you know, obviously you guys are skeptics on the, on the realm of the supernatural. I mean, let's be honest here and admit that. Yeah, but, but as I said, from, I mean, I'm speaking purely for myself here. I don't want to, you know, suppose to speak for my colleagues. But uh, the supernatural, as far as I'm concerned, by definition cannot exist. Because if something exists within reality, no matter how strange the thing is that's existing within reality, it's part of reality and it's natural. If it becomes supernatural, something has to be apart from reality. It has to be you know, external to nature. As there is nothing that is external to nature, no matter how bizarre, then it's impossible, in my mind, for the supernatural to exist. It's illogical to believe it does. And I think any then attempt to build any argument saying that the supernatural should be taken into account is, is doomed to failure. Because, firstly, you've got nothing to, to indicate that such a thing does exist. And there's no evidence at all. So, you know, you're, you're having to say, oh, I have a feeling that the supernatural might exist, or I'm dealing with, you know, a third-hand evidence or people saying, I, I had an experience. Uh, but when we apply uh, just basic sense to some of the experiences oh, that you have, yeah, I mean, people will say, oh, I had an experience, and I, God appeared to me in my room and spoke to me. There's, there's two options that have happened here. The person has either hallucinated or God has appeared to them in their room and spoken to them. And the simplest answer is usually the one that's the right one, is that they've hallucinated. So there's no evidence at all to back up the claims to the supernatural. So I'm, I'm kind of interested to see how you can then make an argument for supernaturalism. Do you, do you, uh, do you all agree that because the vast majority of scientists uh, uh, agree with the theory of evolution, that it must therefore be true? Yeah. Yeah. No, because that would be a, a what do you call it, a fallacy ad populum. Yeah, that would be saying. Yeah, appeal to If it could be the case that everybody in the world could not uh, accept evolution, but that wouldn't affect whether it was the truth True. or not. That wouldn't affect whether it was real or not. Um, you, you could press the reset button on the entirety of human civilization's discovery about the natural world and forget everything that we've learned in the last, let's say, 10,000 years, you could throw it all away, and sooner or later we would rediscover all of the laws of nature all over again, because they exist regardless of our observing them or not. They're just, they're just material reality. Whereas if you press the reset button on a particular religion, for example, it would never emerge again. It could never be written that way again, because it's entirely made. It's based on superstition and fear. We well, propose. I like the... The, sorry, sorry, the Susan, physicist Lawrence Krauss has a, a thing that he, he says often. He says the universe is the way it is, the way whether whether we like it or not. Yeah. It just it just is. So regardless of the number of people claiming this, claiming that, the universe is what it is. Evolution is what it is. The number of people agreeing with it or not doesn't it, uh, affect the you know the truth of it. Yeah, it's absolutely irrelevant. Well, if we all say that, that the glass of water on my table is wine, it doesn't make it wine any more than Absolutely. The, 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 the problem... Sorry, go ahead. Go on, Mike. The, the, the problem, I'm sitting here listening to you guys, and, and, uh, and uh, I appreciate the, 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 the kindness you've afforded me here in this conversation, but when I listen to you, I'm reminded of the vast, vast majority of people who believe the earth was flat, and yet one person comes along and says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, I, 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 try, I try very much not to interrupt you guys, and I would appreciate the same thing here. The problem with the atheism and, and uh, modern atheism, the, the, uh, the non-spiritual atheism, and you know, let's be honest, that's what we're talking about here, is, is that it is indefensible in so much as the vast amount of anecdotal evidence that's available. And anecdotal, yeah, anecdotal evidence doesn't count for anything, Mike. Anecdotal evidence doesn't count. If, if you guys have uh, dictionary.com still available. It's just the way Skype has a delay on this in terms of, sorry about that. No, uh, ain't no problem. That atheism is bereft of anything that you would call spiritual. I mean, it's unfortunate to have to borrow that religious word until a better definition comes along. I think that atheists are fully capable of being, you know, in, 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 hold a sense of awe and wonder for how incredible the universe is, for example, right? 
you lay on your back on a clear night and you look at the stars and you know that you're looking at points of light that originated, in some cases, billions of years ago. Now, right. that's an incredible thing to be, to be completely blown away by. And you can make that statement without ever resorting to any sort of supernatural belief or something which depends upon things that can't be proven. Well, uh, and I'm okay with that. Uh, with the, with the, you know, the majesty of the universe, and no, no Christian in their right mind would ever deny that. Uh, and even on, even on just a purely physical level, natural level, its majesty is, is indisputable. So uh, why isn't that? Enough? Well, however, those of us who, who uh, have actually experienced a personal dynamic relationship with Almighty God uh, know that you're wrong, even though, in spite of you not having uh, experienced it. Uh, an entire belief system has grown up in, in, in response to in response to in, in response to a lack of experience. Now, uh, a anecdotal evidence is real evidence. If you have dictionary.com, if you have dictionary.com still available, you look up the word anecdote. It is a real experience, and uh, it, it, this is just one one uh, small minute portion of evidence that's available. I mean, even Christopher, uh, rather uh, Richard Dawkins, in his book uh, The Blind Watchmaker. Hold that, thought, hold that thought and then feel free to carry on afterwards, but I would just say that anecdotal evidence is weak evidence because it specifically relies upon subjective experiences. It isn't, it isn't a statement of something which can be objectively, verifiably um, defined. It's a, it's a statement made by an individual about their individual experience. It's not a statement made about a system which is, exists independent of that person's experience. So anecdotal evidence, for the same reason that eyewitness evidence in a court of law is weak evidence, specifically because it relies upon the interpretation that an individual makes about something, rather than an objectively verifiable um, statement about the description of the thing which exists independently of that person's opinion and biases. Well, in, in, in fact, in a court of law, eyewitness evidence, as long as it's uh, not made by a single individual, is the primary evidence that is supported for any case. And now we have... And now we have millions of people. Well, we have billions of people saying, "Yes, I've experienced the supernatural." And but this is right, not. We also have hundreds and hundreds of people being that have that have been released from jail after faulty eyewitness testimony. So okay, now you uh, now, now they're not buying that. Uh, well, okay, and, that, and that's fine. But you, you don't have to buy that. Those of us who have experienced the supernatural don't need you to buy it. A person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person with a theory. You are only, right. you are only someone who doesn't believe in the supernatural until you have personally experienced the supernatural. I mean, let's be so, honest. There is no supernatural. Well, that's a logical fallacy, Susan, because you say that because you've never experienced it. That is the converse fallacy of accident. It's to say, I've never seen a black swan, therefore black swans do not exist. That is the, that, that you should... Now, the only logical position to take here is the is that of an agnostic, somebody who says, uh, somebody. Now, Susan, you just said there's no such thing as the supernatural. That is a, that is an illogical thing to say. Rather, you should say, as a logical person, that I don't believe in the supernatural, but I'm willing to accept the evidence. Okay, Mike. For the supernatural to exist, you would need to prove to us that something exists outside of reality. Now, the fact that the word reality refers to everything regardless of where it is or what it is, or, how weird it, or is. how weird it is. I don't know how you could then define something that is beyond that without that thing instantly becoming part of reality. I mean, well, how do you, what's the definition of supernatural for this, this conversation, Mike? Any, uh, the supernatural, the word itself means that which exists outside of nature. And, uh, there that, we go. All yeah, right. But what I'm saying is... don't exist outside yeah. of nature. Well, that's a logical fallacy. No, because you're you're saying that nothing that nothing that I have experienced could possibly exist outside of nature. Therefore, nothing exists outside of nature. No, you've experienced no, something that exists within nature. nature. We're not denying that you that people have profound experiences. What we're saying is that there is a natural explanation for them, regardless of the fact that they may themselves believe there is a supernatural explanation for them. There is not a natural explanation. There is not. Now, first of all, if there's a natural explanation for a miracle. That's because nature has to cooperate with God for that miracle to happen, right? Well, what, what do you define as a miracle? Because most of the time, miracle is happy coincidence. Okay, well, a miracle is something that uh, where nature has uh, agreed with God to conform to what God's will is. That's what a, a, a miracle is. Sorry. Go on, go on, Tim. Sorry, I'm losing you a little bit there, Jim. So what do you say? Define God. Well, that's not the point of this discussion. God is... For, for, You're making an assertion. You need to define God. 
Well, God is the creator. God, so, God is the creator of the universe. Your terms. So God, God wait, 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 let me answer the question. God is the creator of everything that you okay. say that you say is all that exists. Now, if there is a creator, as even I mean, if you take a look, you guys have read some of Dawkins' stuff. In chapter two of the Blind Watchmaker, he says that the evidence uh, for a creator is overwhelming, but we are to ignore the evidence because it's just an illusion. Now, even he sees the evidence. And he says, if you go to richarddawkins.net, and you go to his quotations page, page two, and he says that flowers and elephants are for the exact same thing. They're for making duplicate, you... they're for making okay. duplicate copies of each other going forward. And so what do okay. copies do? Don't assume that, that I agree with every word that Richard Dawkins says. Uh, I'm not going to speak for anybody else here, but don't, don't make the assumption that that all atheists agree with everything that, that Richard Dawkins says. Like I certainly don't. Or I certainly don't. Just, just keep in mind, Mike, just yes. because it, it is somewhat frustrating for us that the only thing atheists share is a lack of belief in God. There's a ton of people who don't believe in Santa Claus, Christians and Muslims and Buddhists. We all have very different backgrounds. All we share, for instance, with you is you don't believe in Santa Claus either. That doesn't make us at all similar. You, you, uh, I that's wouldn't the be so only certain about. Between us. I wouldn't be so certain about my lack of belief in Santa Claus, however. <laughs> you believe in Santa Claus, Mike? Can we agree? With, can we all agree on this? That, that this discussion is not about spiritual atheism. That we all agree that we're talking about the 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 uh, the, uh, the long conversation that's been going on for for hundreds of years. It is the conversation regarding the existence or repudiation of the existence of uh, transcendental realities. That no well, supernatural... I mean, that's an extremely big way of putting it, but what we're actually talking about is the fact, for example, you yourself have said that you've written an article here which is, it goes to, into some length to blithely and blanketly assume that atheists are cannibals. Uh, now, to me... You've undone your own argument there by saying that we're not talking about what you refer to as spiritual atheists. I don't quite know what you mean by that. You seem to be fairly versed to actually flesh out what you mean by that definition. If you're talking about atheism in the sense of the word where it's come to mean, particularly, as I said earlier, in American politics, people who kind of, you know, the likes of Dawkins, who, who you know, some of his tactics just make my toes cold because I know that the next day in my mailbox, blog comments are going to be full of people who just assume that I go along with everything the guy says. And when you use this word atheism to refer to a, a blanket group of people as if you're referring to everybody who doesn't happen to subscribe to your particular religion, that kind of that kind of sweeping generalization immediately alienates people who might otherwise agree with you. Okay. And, and uh, thank you for saying that, uh, Jim. Uh, I, I don't believe that, uh, I don't believe that uh, everyone... Uh, all, all atheists believe uh, that Richard Dawkins is is the is their is their leader or anything like that. We run across all kind all sorts of people who who uh, who disagree with Dawkins. I'm not saying that, uh, and 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 you know obviously I uh, I should probably leave his name out of this, <laughs> uh, but um, let's just say that uh, that modern atheism, academic atheism, is the is the uh, is the presupposition that no supernatural realities exist. I mean, I don't know, I don't see why why the panel here has such a hard time with this. Yeah, but what, the thing is, though, the mic, what we've already said to you is that if something exists, it is by definition not supernatural, because it exists, because it is part of nature. Uh, so, I mean, I'm still at a loss to work out how you can, you can say that, uh, you know, you're saying to us, oh, you're denying that any supernatural experience could exist, and we're saying, yes, that, that is the case, because nothing can be supernatural. We're not denying that you may well experiences, but you've experienced something that either you've hallucinated or has actually happened within the physical universe, making a natural occur naturally occurring event. It is not supernatural. So no matter what it is you've, you've had experience to you, as soon as it tries to become something that's real, as soon as it becomes something that exists within the physical universe, it is something that is part of that reality. It cannot be, by definition, supernatural. Alex, you're presupposing here that people do not have the ability to access the supernatural. 
But that's not no, true. No, 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 you seem to be misunderstanding. What I'm saying is that the second, the moment something happens and actually tangibly happens within reality, yeah. that thing is a natural event. It is, cannot be supernatural because it exists within nature. It is, by definition, natural. Well, therein it lies cannot the, be a supernatural event. Therein lies the fallacy because you're saying right. it cannot be a supernatural event. Now, people are experiencing supernatural events every day. And no, yet, but they're not seeing natural events that they're ascribing to the supernatural. Exactly. Well, okay. Now that's the that's your that's your explanation of it. That's how you that's, not. that's how you 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 sleep at night with with the by jettisoning the the uh, the realities that exist outside of nature. That they, you reason that into your mind that all things have to happen naturally because all that exists is nature. And we're saying I'm well, not calling Christians cannibals. Okay, now are we going to finally talk about that? or? We'll, we'll come to that in a moment, because right. I'm still interested about this whole thing with supernaturalism. You, you it's a matter of definitions, Alex. It, it, yeah. You two aren't going to get matching definitions on no. this No, this is the thing. I mean, you're, you're saying that... Uh, right, you're saying that people are ex experiencing supernatural events, or they're experiencing events that they're ascribing to the supernatural. Uh, but there's, there's never been any evidence whatsoever that anything supernatural has ever happened. There's huh. zero evidence to support it. Uh, well, creation, creation itself uh, would argue against that. Yeah, but there's no evidence for creation, and there's plenty of evidence to contradict it. So you, you're, you're, you, you believe in, in, what, in what Aristotle believed in spontaneous generation, then? Not at all, no. no. I accept... The, I accept the very, very well-supported theory of evolution. Now, the origins of life are a completely separate thing. I mean, that's a biogenesis. That's not evolution. So those two things are separate. Are they? No, but spontaneous generation yes. is nonsense. I mean, spontaneous generation was the idea that uh, inanimate objects such as meat could generate out of themselves maggots. It wasn't... It's, it's been misused by uh, creationists who try to say that the biogenesis is the same thing. A biogenesis is basically saying that things that are organic compounds and, and chemicals that can become organic compounds will then eventually form into self-replicating multicellular life. Multicellular life. Now, we've seen that, an example of that this week where under the right pressures, single-celled yeast has become multicellular and has then this new life form, which has evolved in the lab, has then started reproducing itself an empirical observation of Darwinian evolution by natural selection in a laboratory this month. Oh, all right. Now, I, I will look into that, and I appreciate you uh, you giving me that information. We can uh, send you a link if it helps. Uh, well, please do at ppsimmons at live.com. Uh, but uh, we have taken... Now, I'm not a scientist, all right? I, uh, but uh, what, what does the word science mean? Can, can any of you offer a definition for the word science? An observation of natural phenomena. Are we all agreed on that? It sounds reasonable to me. Yeah. It, it, it's a very basic definition. The word, I'll go even more basic than that. The word science uh, comes from the Latin word scientia. And that word literally means knowledge. Knowledge, that's right. What, that's what science is. Scientific method, in its most basic form, is using that knowledge to predict future outcomes. Right? Now, when we look at the knowledge... That's, that's those predictions are correct, and if they're not correct, then they're... Yeah, testing and, them. Right, and there are tests that we do, and uh, now I'm not a scientist, and uh, but uh, I don't know what it's like in, in uh, England, I'm sure it's the same in England, that in Canada, we own the science. The people own the science, it's all taxpayer funded. We use the science, and we take the science, but we, we, we remove the, 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 uh, the findings by the people, who many times are inserting their own opinions into the findings, and we look at that, and we, we take, you know, for example, we can apply Occam's razor to it and say, well, the most reasonable explanation here is that, uh, you know, nylonase is, is just a nylon. It's just a bacteria, and it's been doing what bacteria have been doing for thousands of years, digesting petroleum products, right? And that, it's still bacteria, and we look at, you know, what happens to the equine genus in that, uh, you know, once they hit the mule wall, they can't reproduce anymore. The kinds are always remaining kind, the same kinds or genuses. And, and that's what we look at, and that's the knowledge. And so we can predict, we can predict that, uh, that a, a bacteria is going to stay a bacteria, and it's never going to be, uh, you know, the microbe-to-man evolution has never been observed. And as far as, we're, con as, far, as, far as we're concerned... Just because that, you that, never see a black swan, they don't exist? Okay, hang on a second. As far as we're concerned at P.P. Simmons, 
Uh, this, this is not science. Uh, 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 pan species, pan genus evolution is not science. As far as we're concerned, now people can go, now I'm not a scientist. Now people can go to the P.P. Simmons YouTube channel. We have hundreds of videos refuting the theory of Darwinian evolution. Uh, people, oh. can go, people can go to uh, the, the, the Center for Creation Research, CMI, and uh, they have they have real scientists doing no. real science, and we can go to you can go to you can go to uh, Jonathan Sar Jonathan Sarfati. Have you guys ever heard of Jonathan? Can we just let Jim say something there, Jim? Oh, so I'm sorry, Jim. Go ahead. Yes. We're aware of the fact that some people are incapable of reading the evidence, which is right in front of them. What would you say is the latest? greatest argument against Darwin evolution by natural selection, setting aside all the stuff that's been shown in a court of law to be not based in reality. What's what's the new argument? What's the new tract? Why is this coming up again and again and again? Why 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 do you refuse to read the facts that are right in front of you? Well, because given enough time, if people marry themselves to Darwinian evolution, given enough time they're gonna fa they're gonna face a divorce. I mean we looked at Tick Tolik. We look at you ask for an example. Let's give an example. Tick Tolik. Has now just been proven to be not a transitional entity, but it's just a it's just a, a bird. I mean, you look at uh, you look at the fraud that is prevalent throughout uh, the the, text, the textbooks with Piltdown like Man. It's still a transitional form. Every everything single fossil is transitional form. Well, everything that's alive is technically yeah, absolutely. Form. Evolution doesn't have an end point. Okay, you, ask, you okay? You asked for the most the most recent. The most recent out of the for in, on the creationist side is just this week out of Canada. Uh, the uh, the tar sands. The, uh, for every scoop they pull out of the out of the ground, a scoop of tar full of oil, they're pulling up hundreds of uh, bones. These are bones with with flesh on them. These are not fossils. And supposed uh, evolutionary deep time theory would put these at millions of years old. That this flesh is not allowed. Is not does not live for millions of years old with vi a viable DNA. I mean this stuff. Is being uh, is being suppressed and and uh, there's so much evidence that people just need to go and well I mean people people need to need to uh, look at the the non mainstream I mean, I mean the vast majority of the mainstream media is, is in bed with uh, Darwinian evolution because I mean let's face it it's it's uh, it sounds nuanced and and most of academia embraces it but all people need to do is watch the movie uh, Expelled by uh, Ben Stein. Uh, I'm Dark. listening. Uh, evolution, Mike. Yes. Mike, evolution by natural selection has been studied for more than 150 years by a lot of very intelligent people all over the world in different disciplines. It has stood the test of time. It is real science. There's oh, the only reason to go anywhere else is if your personal beliefs. Are threatened. Well, may, may I say, Susan, may I say that our position is that Darwinian evolution is not real science. Now, I know, I know you don't want to hear that, but even, and I know I said I wouldn't bring up Dawkins. It doesn't matter what I want to hear. Whether okay, I want well, to hear hang on a minute. It's just not true. Well, I could say that to you. I, okay, I'm going to tell you this. I don't, it doesn't matter what you believe, Susan. It's just not true. Now, is that, okay. a, is that a real argument? No, it's not. Well, Mike, can I just present something to you? Just upon the available evidence. Yeah. The available evidence, which was published on January uh, the 17th, 2012, in the uh, peer-reviewed journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, the paper Experimental Evolution of Multicellularity by William C. Ratcliffe, R. Ford Dennison, Mark Borello, and Michael Travisano. That's a peer-reviewed paper in a peer-reviewed journal, uh, which proves, which has evidence of single-cell organisms becoming multicellular. That is the kind of evolution you say cannot happen, yet it has been, I'm looking at photographs of things that have evolved. I'm looking at the ancestor, and I'm looking at the next generation, and I'm looking at subsequent generations. Uh, I'm, I'm that, that, that woman was based upon the findings of Richard Lensky about five years ago, who empirically observed um, e. coli bacteria evolving into different species in the laboratory as well. Different species of what, though? May, 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 may I ask? Now, I'm not a scientist. I am not a scientist. But may I ask? May I ask? May I ask? Different species of what? Well, it's gone from being a single-celled organism to being a multi-celled organism. Well, Jim mentioned E. coli, and he said that it's been observed moving from one species to another. Species of what? 
the of, different species of E. coli bacteria. Of bacteria. Now, now let me let me just let me just let me just, let me just, take, let me just take a step back here and explain and explain. and given no alternative but to feed on a different food source, which they couldn't ordinarily digest, or whatever the word is for what bacteria do with uh, nutrients. And given the fact that they had no other food source, rather than die, they evolved in the laboratory over 12 years with multiple um, uh, blind, blind, blind tests carried out to corroborate that this wasn't uh, some kind of outside source that was in, 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 uh, bringing new material into the experiment. Repeatedly over the course of 12 years, and eventually this new strain of bacteria evolved so that it could digest this other strain of nitrate. It became a different species of E. coli bacteria. Right, the same thing was observed... Jim, the same thing was observed with uh, with with nylon eating bacteria, right? Yes, but you see, the thing is, I think what's happening here, uh, Mike, is. Well, that I'd like to address Jim for a second here, but okay, go please, on. go ahead, please, because Jim. because the Bible is very clear. Now, I'm I'm going to use the Bible here, just just an example. Jim, I just want to use the Bible as an example here. I'm not here to, ahead, to I'm not here to uh, to defend the Bible. I'm not doing that. There's not yeah, enough time. There's not. Okay. Well, I, because I'm a, I'm a Christian. Okay. The Bible says that all of humanity, all of uh, creation, the biological creation, and uh, and uh, so plant and animal life, was created after its own kind. Now, the Bible gives several examples, several examples of species within a kind. Mutating, evolving. I mean, what does the evolution mean? It's just a change over time. And I'll, I'll go any further, Mike. I just want to say, where, what, whereabouts in the Bible does it give an example of of uh, speciation? Well, speciation is. Oh, well, there's a there's a case of Jacob when he was uh, when he was. And I don't have my Bible in front of me because we're not. I'm not here to make a case for the Bible. I'm here to make a case against naturalistic atheism. All right. Okay. Now there is the case of Jacob. He's with his uncle, and he's about to leave. And he now the word the name Jacob means uh, one who's a tr who's a trickster, who's a deceiver, right? And then his name was eventually changed to Israel. Now he's with his now he's he's living up to his name now. He's he's running his uncle's uh, uh, herds, and he places the he does speciation uh, within just a couple of generations with the, with, with, the, the, with the I believe it was with a colored stick. Uh, sticks painted black and white is the story. Now, I mean, that's you, this, you're, you're quoting the story as if it's got some relevance to reality. I mean, that's a myth. That's well, you, you say it's well, well. All right. Well, I I say if you want to say it's a myth, I say that evolution, pan genus uh, Darwinian evolution, is the creation myth for modern atheism. This is now. This was. A, this is a, Richard Dawkins said that. That's not. I know. I know you guys aren't Richard Dawkins fans, but he did say that. Can I ask you a straight question, Mike? Please. I'm not a scientist, have, by the way. Okay. No, I understand <laughs> that. You've said that several times, but this is a straight question for you. Yes. Do you actually understand what evolution is? Yes, I do. What, what is your definition of evolution, or what is the commonly accepted de definition of evolution as you understand it? No, you mean uh, Darwinian evolution. Well, no evolution. I mean evolution. Evo the word evolution means change over time. That's okay. What you mean. So. Now let's let's look at some, let's look at an example here. Then, so we've got today we're starting with. Well, well, let's think, sorry, what's your understanding of natural selection? Uh, that, 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 that given given uh, given uh, natural uh, uh, influences, uh, uh, biological entities change over time. That's okay, what it is. Cool. So, do you accept that natural selection happens? Of course, it does. Okay. Listen to me. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example of evolution in humanity. Mount Everest, tallest mountain on Earth, right? Yeah. When someone attempts to climb Mount Everest, they have to stop at approximately 20,000 feet. Why? They have to stop there to evolve. They spend five weeks at 20,000 oh. feet. They're not evolving. Hang on, hang on. They're, what? They're just We've really got to stop you there. They're, they're no, wait a minute. No. Okay, stop me then. I won't go on. But you're, you're preaching. You're acclimating. They're acclimating. Acclimation is wait a minute. Acclimation is change over time. They, their bo their body. No, no, no. Hang on. Their body develops the ability to double its red blood cells. Right. That's just a natural response to a low oxygen environment. That is natural selection. No, it isn't. Natural selection is something. There's mutations in genes. 
When, when people climb Mount Everest, they have to take along with them Sherpas from the local village who've lived in that area for a couple of thousand years because they uh, are slightly differently evolved so that they can actually breathe. To Thank you. Thank you. And there are people, there are people who are not Sherpas who, given enough time, have developed the ability to, uh, to scale Everest without even any supplemental oxygen. Now, so these people, these people have evolved. They've, they've changed no, they over, haven't. they have, Susan, they have changed over time. That's the, that's the truest Can definition. I ask you a question, Mike? That is the truest definition of evolution, is change over Cass, time. Cat's got a question. Go on, Cat. These people who go up um, Everest and come back down and, and have this change where they can then breathe, if they were then to reproduce, would their children be able to breathe on Everest without having to stop? Would they suddenly have the, the Sherpa's ability to, to breathe without having to, to rest? Well, why don't see why not? Why not? Well, they would. Okay. They would. The fact that you've said that indicates that you actually have zero understanding of how evolution yep. works. And because it doesn't, because evolution, yeah. it's change between generations. It's not going to be a change that happens within the individual. Uh, you can acclimatize to different uh, situations, but the ability to do that was already there when you were born. There are people. There are people. There are people, there are people and I, 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 I'm not prepared with their names, who. Now, generally speaking, when someone climbs Everest, they stop at 20,000 feet. Yeah. Their, their body uh, recognizes yeah. that, it, that it needs to evolve, and it... It's uh, not evolving. Well, hang on. If evolution means change over time. They spend five weeks... Of, they spend but that's not the sort of time... But that's not the conversation about. we're having. They're, they're okay. talking about... Yes. Yeah, not a okay. Like... We might as well move on, because I'm not going to get to finish this yeah, analogy okay, here. We're getting a little bit bogged down here. Let's talk about animals. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm getting ganged up on here, Alex. Uh, I'm sorry? <laughs> They're yeah, ganging sorry, up on me here. Okay, yeah, everybody, just, we just need to step up back a little bit, just make sure we're not talking over each other. Um, <laughs> right, okay, so yes, I think we're getting bogged down there. I think, I think we're absolutely right there. Uh, let's cut straight to it then. Uh, Mike, you believe that uh, you have said that all atheists uh, are cannibals. I, I didn't think we'd have such a trouble, such trouble uh, nailing down the, the definition of atheist here. Can we just agree that, for the sake of this discussion, we're talking about the atheism that embraces the non-existence of any supernatural realities? That's what I would. That's what I would describe. Uh, uh, from from my point of view, that's what an atheist is. But that's not a description of atheism. Atheism is a lack of belief in gods, and that is the simple basics of it. But so we're, we're discussing the people who have no belief in the supernatural. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I like to I, I, I like to open up the now I, I'm surprised at the the enigma this has become for so many people because uh, th th this should be rather this should be rather accepted among the the uh, the uh, a supernaturalists uh, because pe now I like to open this up with a joke now I, I, I listened to you I think it was your Christmas show and, uh, and is Jim trying to say something there? Okay, we're just coughing. All right. So anyway, I like to open this up with a joke because I find that you guys like to like to have a good time. And uh, so uh, a guy walks into a bar, an average-looking guy, and he walks up to the most beautiful woman in the bar. And he says, excuse me, but uh, will you have sex with me for a million dollars? And she says, well, of course. And then he says, all right, well, uh, will you have sex with me for five dollars? And she says, well, what kind of woman do you think I am? And he says, well, we've already established that. We're just haggling on price. So essentially, that's the essential argument for the cannibal uh, reference to uh, a supernaturalist, that uh, people are made out of uh, meat and uh, they're just animals. And so when we did the research for the book, uh, we allowed atheists to, uh, to get on board and, uh, anonymously and answer the question. Given, given even the most extreme circumstances, is there ever a case where you would eat another human being to stay alive? All right, 100% of the respondents answered in the affirmative, where the Christian respondents answered about 50-50. Now, Christians, in this, their truest sense, uh, if we allow the Bible to, uh, Jesus himself, to define what a Christian is, Jesus says a Christian is someone who hears my voice and follows me. That's what a Christian is. That eliminates the vast majority of Christians today who use Christianity as fire insurance. Just in case there's a hell. I mean, the Roman Catholics, they baptize children because the Roman Catholic religion teaches that all 
Roman Catholics who have been baptized go to heaven. Even if they have to go through purgatory, they're going to make it to heaven. So Christianity, for the vast majority of people, is fire insurance. Nothing more, it's just in case. But Jesus himself defines Christianity as a person who hears his voice and follows him. All right? Now, people who hear his voice and follow him know that Did they're... Did Jesus ever actually use the word Christianity, by the way? Well, yeah, the... I was going to say. <laughs> the, the... Define I mean, Christianity at all. He doesn't so define it at all. Okay, okay. hang on now. The, the, uh, the, the, the word Christian didn't come about until uh, the book of Acts when uh, they went into a uh, town and they were, they were called Christians and it sort of stuck. But Jesus, uh, Jesus is the Christ and the word Christian, the first, uh, first half of that word is the name Christ. Well, the, sorry to interrupt you again, but Josephus made reference to the Christos, meaning the, the Christos meaning the anointed one. Right. The, the, the only uh, independent historical evidence of there being a Jesus of Nazareth uh, uh, is, is by the first century historian Josephus. There isn't any reference to the Bible doctor. itself, apart from the books that came after the crucifixion, as it were. If you read the, the book of Acts, when, they, when, the, when the disciples came into a town called Antioch, that's when they were first called Christians. And it's in the book of Acts, you can look that up yourself. But either way, a Christian today is somebody who... Who, uh, now, we, we, uh, we, uh, we surveyed, we sur we surveyed no. anonymous atheists and we surveyed Christians, because we are a Christian ministry. And uh, like I said, 100% of the respondents, this is all in the book, 100% of the respondents uh, responded that they would eat human flesh because people are just animals made out of meat. And so, no, but that's, that's not why they said it, was it? Why? I need to I need to draw you know I need to stop you there, Mike, because I mean your article itself says that you asked them if there was no other option and it was down right. to life or death, right. and there was somebody else who was with them who had died, mm. and they had a choice of either dying or you know fighting down all the abhorrent feelings that it would draw pull up in any human being and eating the the body of their fallen comrade. They would whether they would eat that body to survive. Now they said yes because in. In that case, where there's literally no other option, that's what most people would answer yes. Now, it's interesting you say that, that atheists are cannibals, but one of, the, one of the most famous instances of people being in that exact situation mm -hmm. was when uh, the uh, uh, Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571 crashed uh, in the Andes. Uh, that was carrying the old Christians club rugby union team. They were Christians. Now, they had to eat each other to survive. They ate their fallen comrades. Those people were Christians. So, in history, in our recent history, in the Western world, or in, in, our, in a modern civilization, the, the most recent and most well-publicized instance of people being forced to eat the bodies of their deceased comrades was Christians doing it when they crashed in a plane. So, I'm not sure where your argument is going there, because we've seen that if people are pushed to the point where they have a choice of either dying or doing that, then that has eventually becomes the only option. Now, these guys put this off for days and days and days to the point where they were almost at death's door, and it was a choice between literally dying or eating to survive. And you know, I think what's happened there is, it, with, the, with the questions you've asked people, they've been... They've, framed it in that kind of situation where if they had literally no other choice and it was a choice between dying or eating something to survive so that they could be rescued then they would eat something and if that thing happened to be one of their fallen comrades they would do it now it doesn't mean they'd want to do it or that they'd like doing it or that if there was any other option that they'd they'd not take that other option first it's not that we could have all got you know person burgers in our freezers that we just throw on for a laugh it's if you're pushed to the point where you've got no other choice, most human beings, or in fact most living things, will eventually cannibalize members of their own species to survive. So I don't see what point you were trying to make with it, because it, it seems... The survival that, instinct is strong. Yeah. I mean, I know that you say in your article that uh, for you that situation wouldn't happen. Uh, you say here, I'll quote from the article, what would I do if I was faced with the choice of starvation or cannibalism? The choice will never be part of my life. So immediately you're trying to avoid answering the question. You come up with a, a different answer, and you say the choice will never be part of my life. In, in my existential paradigm, there is also always the God option. I would pray. I would expect one of three or more of a combination of things to happen: either God would rescue me out of the predicament, or He would provide me with food to eat, or probably a combination of both. A third option would be a supernatural sustaining of the body until help arrived. Why did none of those three options happen for these guys that crashed in the Andes? 
This is why I, I opened this discussion with the, first of all, the joke which says that if you would, if you would have sex for money, you are a prostitute. If you would eat human flesh, if you've already made up your mind that you would eat human flesh to survive, you are a cannibal. And so, no, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, Susan. Uh, the, uh, the point that Alex was just making was that, uh, was that either starvation or either death or, uh, or, um, or, a, or life, one would eat human flesh, and yet, when I, when I said all that about the difference between a real Christian and just someone in name only, who is doing it just for fire insurance, is that real Christians, real Christians hear the voice of Jesus, therefore they know that if the body stops functioning, that does not mean death. That is not death for a Christian. When the body, when the body stops... The, well, the, Alex the, has already pointed out that the only time this has actually ever happened in the real world, it actually involved a group of... Okay, no, well, I was just getting to that, Jim. Thank you for saying that. Uh, the most famous case in North America is the Donner case. When they were, Have you guys heard of the Donner case? Yes. Right. The Donner case is, is, a, is a group of supposed Christians who tried to climb, uh, go from Nevada to California, cross Donner Pass, and they ended up eating one another, etc., etc. The, these are these are these are either supposed Christians, Christians in name only, or oh, so, so this is a no true Scotsman fallacy. The no so true. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So basically, what's happening here, Mike? Just let, just so I can clarify. I have to Make address this, your wife. Let, though. Let, let me just let me just because I'm just going to I'll bring this to that in a moment. But so what you're saying is that atheists are cannibals because they are willing to eat each other. Yet when we supply evidence that the only time this has actually ever happened is been Christians doing it, you're saying they're not Christians at all. What I'm saying is that now if I was if I could be allowed to finish my point, the, yeah. the, you have in the case of Donner, in the case of the the uh, soccer club that crashed in the Andes, in all these cases, and believe me, since I've written this article, I've heard every case imaginable. And, and so many of them do involve persons who call themselves Christians, okay? <laughs> There's an irony there, isn't there? So you want to say that then? All right. Now, I, may, I, I would propose that the vast majority of them are operating on two levels. One is they're operating out of fear of the unknown, right? The other is, now I'm talking about the Christians, the other is that they're simply borrowing an atheist tenet, that people have evolved, people have evolved from a common ancestor, an ape-like creature, and, uh, and they're nothing more than animals anyway. And if you watch the movie Alive, it's the documentary, well, it's the, it's the hype documentary of the, of the example that was given earlier. And, and in, that, in that they agonized over it, and they basically came to the conclusion that, um, that the life on earth is all there is. And, and, so, and so they're borrowing from an atheist tenet. And, uh, it's not a tenet. It is a tenet. Read my book. Just a fact. Reading no. your book doesn't make it a tenet any more than exactly. Okay. You're I'll... saying that it's a tenet doesn't make it a tenet. Just because somebody would eat another person doesn't make them a cannibal. Okay, hang on. I want to get to this okay. now. I want. I want. I want to. Some group of atheists that you ask these questions to. That was my. That was my next point here. Okay. These sure. were. These were. No, we didn't just go to YouTube for the for the pool of atheists. We went to our blog and and YouTube, and those were our sources for the atheist comments. And they were allowed to comment. What was your sample size? They were allowed. It was thousands, and they were allowed to comment uh, anonymously, which gave gave us a, a more accurate indication than somebody than somebody who who had to give their name and address and phone number so we could follow up with them. But basically, the, essentially, 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 here's the thing: if you would now the panel that I'm talking to now, would you all eat human flesh to survive? Yes. Yes. Then you're all can no other option. Then you are cannibals. Have another option. You are cannibals. No, I'm not a cannibal. <laughs> well, okay, let me let me catch, let me just slightly change this around for you. I'm going to ask you a question, Mike. Okay. Yeah. You're in a hypothetical situation. Yes. You are given a choice. Yes. Where you have to murder one innocent individual. Yes. In the street, or everybody on earth will die. Well, that comes that what comes to do? that comes to the transcendental reality of good. I mean, Dan Barker, Dan Barker... I'm asking you a direct question. What would you do? Would you, if... Okay, I'm going to ask you the question again. Yes. You have, you have a choice. You can kill one innocent person. Yes. Or everybody, seven billion plus innocent people in the world, will die. What do you do? Well, the, the case came up with uh, Barker about... And he used the exact same example, but he used, the, the, he used rape as an example. That yeah. An alien... So what would you do? So Your answer. 
Yeah, I wouldn't kill any. Uh, no, I wouldn't murder. But uh, but what if is for children, though, but, Alex? But you would murder by the so very you fact that you're not doing anything. People. By your your inaction, you who's, would be a murderer. Who's you killing the Who's killing the seven billion though? Because Dan Burke. The whole study is what if. Yeah, let me just recapture that. No, it's, wait a minute. No, it's not what if, Susan, because these are actual examples of people okay. eating yeah, other people. Hypothetical situation. You said if you asked these people what yeah. their decision would be if they were in that situation. What if you were in this situation? What would you do? Well, these yes, are, uh, uh, these are th this was uh, th this whole discussion started with with an, an example of the soccer team in the Andes. So this was a real example. Now, give me give me a, how what kind of case? Well, Christians, arguably Christians or not, if they were Christians, they were borrowing an atheistic tenet. But and this is. No, they're not. You've, you've avoided answering my question. I'm going to I'm going to ask it again. No, I wouldn't kill. I already answered that. I may have been cut off, but I wouldn't kill anybody. Okay, no, but, but you're not understanding the question. Yeah. By the, the situation you're in, yeah. this hypothetical situation is, by the act of deciding not to kill the innocent person, you are consciously deciding to kill everybody else. No, so that's you not... are killing somebody, whatever you do. No, that's not true. You're in that situation. Well, how is it, who, wait a minute, who's killing the seven billion, though? That's what I want to know. It doesn't matter, because in the hypothetical situation, if the choice is, but if the decision as to who lives and who dies is based on what you decide to do, what do you do? I, I, there's another example of it is, say there's uh, there's a train coming down a, a railway track, yeah. and down one siding there's a bunch of guys working, and down the other siding there's uh, a single guy who's got his back to the line or whatever. And you have a choice. You have to choose one or the other. What would you choose? You have to choose to, you've either got to choose to kill the one guy, or you've got to choose to kill all the, the group of guys. Now, the, the way that choice manifests itself is you have to throw, you have to choose to throw a uh, switch or for not. the for the points on the railway or not. If if now, if that's a single either or choice. If now, if, if, if any of my choice if if, if if any of my choices involve killing somebody, it doesn't happen. They but the thing is, you've no choice because both of them involve it. Have to make a decision there and then kill one or kill them all. No, because there there is the God option. That is, if God says if if God says thou shalt not murder, which He has said, okay, then I don't murder, and the results are in His hands. I can't be responsible for murdering someone, you guys. You can't be responsible for 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 murdering somebody just because you want to take control of the results. So, in the situation that we're giving, you would abstain from responsibility altogether. I wouldn't kill somebody. Else. Doing nothing. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to add a third option in here for you, Mike. Thank you. Kill everybody, save the one innocent person. Kill the one innocent person, save everybody else. There, there's a, do there's nothing. a third option. Do nothing. Okay. Everybody dies. You're asking me, right? Options. You're asking yeah. me. You're asking me as a Christian, who yeah. has studied the Bible, and knows that uh, that the shedding of innocent blood is a far greater offense than standing by and watching incidents happen that are out of my control. And you say they're in my control, they're not because I'm a Christian. But you've, given, you've been given three options in this situation. Now, the reason I'm laboring this is because what I'm trying to show to you yeah. is that the dilemma that you presented atheists with, yeah. with was a false dilemma. You were saying to them that if you do this, you are a cannibal. Now, I'm trying to show to you that, that whatever you do in the argument that I've created, you're a murderer. Now, I don't think you're a murderer. No, my ana no, my the my. The I'm using is the same as the one you're using. No, it's using. not, though, Alex. You're, using, you're saying that if you, would, the same if you would consider doing it, you're a cannibal. I'm saying that in the situation that I've given you, a, a hypothetical situation where you have no choice and people will die, whatever you do, that in that situation you're a murderer. Now the thing is, I need an opportunity to answer this question. It's exactly that, the same analogy, Mike. The situation is meaningless. And, it's try and I'm trying to use it to explain and illustrate to you that the point you're making about uh, atheists being cannibals is meaningless because until you've actually committed the act, you are not that thing. It, it, okay. If somebody... It, okay, I, I need an opportunity to speak here. Go on. If, 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 uh, if someone has made up their mind that given the proper set of circumstances, they would rape a woman, that person is a rapist. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, now, given the given the set of circumstances you've given as far as the eat, as far as killing someone, if you eat, if you've made up your mind that you would eat a human being in order to survive, you are no different than the rapist who has made up his mind that he would rape someone given the set of circumstances required. Now, if if any of this now all of this is is contingent upon you eating someone 
or you raping someone. In the case you've given, I need do nothing. I need just, I need do nothing. Okay, so you're say, equating rape and survive. And no, no, it's just an example. Following an instinct to survive as, as, as moral equivalence. And no, I not. didn't. No, I didn't. I just gave the example that would you not agree that if someone has made up their mind that if the set of circumstances were right, just like the people... Someone the, isn't a rapist until they rape somebody. Okay, well, that's your opinion. But I say if someone's made up their mind to do it, they are that. As a man thinks in his heart, so is so he. So you believe in the thought police, then. That's good to know. I can ask you a question, Mike. Yes. What's wrong with eating people? Okay, thank you. So, so cannibalism is an acceptable activity. No, no, I'm, I'm to not you. saying that. I'm asking you a direct question. Tell me what's wrong with eating people. When we, when we, now you're asking a Christian, okay? And yeah. in the in the Bible, the only examples of cannibalism are the direct result of of uh, not seeking God. Of and there are, I mean, Second Kings gives an example that is horrific. And it was the direct result of people not seeking God, abandoning faith, abandoning God. Cannibalism, oh, the only times it's mentioned in the Bible are times when a lack of faith is involved. And whenever I'm going to I'm gonna have to interrupt you there, Mike. Yeah. Matthew twenty six twenty six. Yeah. Whilst they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. You're, you're assuming that I've never heard that example before. That's been brought up quite a few times. Mm -hmm. That... That, uh, since people are not eating his uh, blood... Now, look, look at the example. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Look at the example. The doctrine of transubstantiation. That the well, I know, that's a Roman Catholic doctrine. I get that. Yeah. But look but they, at the... But the Bible's pretty clear on the idea that it actually is... It, it's kind of saying that it becomes literally the body and blood of Christ. Well, you know, uh, let's not gloss over this, because that's not clear. When Jesus was doing the... And I read it very carefully. Jesus was saying... This is my body, which is shed for you. What was he giving them? He was giving them giving bread. He bread. wasn't ripping strips of flesh off his body out. But the thing is, if it isn't his body, if it doesn't represent his body, then it's meaningless. It represents saying, his body. Let me finish. Yes. If he's saying, take and eat, this yes. is my body, but it's actually just bread, so don't worry about it. Wait a minute, he said, then, do... Then taking, yeah. and eat, taking bread and wine means nothing. He said, do this... A bit of a hole here. He said, do this in remembrance of me. This is all... But he just said a, it was his body. He said, "Do this in remembrance of me." It was, a, it was, a, it was a metaphor. It was an analogy. It was metaphor. Listen, Susan. Why did he say that? Obviously, Susan, he wasn't ripping strips of flesh off himself. He was giving them bread. I'm not suggesting he was. But okay. What is the meaning of this? Is my body? He says, "Do this in remembrance of me." It's an act of remembrance. It's an act of remember. This so is the, the why doctrine of. Describe the bread. I want you to just tell me why he described the bread as, as his body. Then. The bread symbolizes the act of the sacrifice on the cross, Susan. This is this is basic knowledge for people who haven't accepted the ridiculous doctrine of of transubstantiation. Okay. But in in First Corinthians eleven, uh, yeah. Paul equates the body and blood of Christ with the bread and the cup of benediction. Well, he equates so, I mean, it, again, yeah. he does the same thing again. Well, he does, and he's just reminding people to do what Jesus said to do, to break bread with each other and drink the cup of the, the vine, to do this in remembrance of him. That's all that is. This is not cannibalism. But then it's meaningless if it isn't saying, this is my body. It's not. It's not. It's a, for you, this is my bread. This is, you know, this is my blood. It's well, not I, meaningless I, when it causes people to remember. Why didn't it be symbolic of something else? Why did it have to be symbolic of his flesh and blood? Because Jesus gave his body as a sacrifice for humanity, and he spilled his blood for the remission of sins. So the act of, of uh, eating bread and drinking uh, the fruit of the vine with other people, and, uh, these things have all been tested. This is not turning into flesh and blood. This is not cannibalism, and, this is, uh, and it's ridiculous to suggest it. So 1 Corinthians 11 uh, verse 27, Paul says, So then, whoever eats this, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an, in an unworthy manner mm. will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Mm. So, I mean, it seems to me that you're sort of saying that, oh, that's not cannibalism. And, yeah, and does that not mean that you're at risk of uh, drinking the, the wine and eating the bread in an unworthy manner, which is, again, as the Bible says, sinning against the body and blood of the Lord? Again, uh, you're in a bit of... Um, 
like no, not at all. I mean, as as a as a as a born again Christian, we we do this as a as a celebration of what Jesus did on the cross. It, well, I'm not eating uh, uh, actual flesh and, and another person's flesh and drinking their blood. The the the, the, the accusation is absurd. I mean, this is the. <laughs> The the the, uh, the act is obvious that we do this. That's in right. Okay. Uh, Why is it wrong for a person to eat another person's body to survive? Well, because like I think I answered that once already. That uh, in the Bible, this is a direct the direct outcome of abandoning God, and uh, this should Those be. Those are the examples. In and, the and another and another another thing too is that it's an act of uh, unbelief because uh, as Christians we believe that the death is not the end. Why eat another? People are not animals. People are in, not in reality. Animals. In reality, we've already seen examples where the people who've actually done this were Christians. Well, they're so, bar they're borrowing from from atheism, just like atheists borrow so, from just like so atheists you, borrow from theists when they use logic. Are you? Uh, no, that's. that's <laughs> I'm that's, afraid that's, not. I'm sorry. No, no, no. We'll come back to that in a minute. But are you saying separate? Just oh, I want that on my phone. Okay. What I was going to say, Mike, is that. You're saying that these people, in the position where they had literally no choice but to eat others or die, thought, you know what, I'm going to justify this to myself by borrowing some atheist worldview. Yeah, you I, say I, they consciously did this. Well, that or, or a complete, or just a, a, an act based on fear, fear of the unknown. I mean, so, that, are, so you're saying they either made that decision or just acted as scared human beings. Right. So they were, what's wrong with they being were doing anything being? different than somebody would be that was fighting off somebody who was trying to kill them. It's not an act of unbelief or fear of the unknown. It's 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 fighting. It's a natural instinct for survival. Okay. According to you, a Christian should just allow somebody to stab them to death. No, I, I've never said that. <laughs> no, well, I'm t I'm I'm. It's analogous, is what I'm trying to tell you. Your analogy is bullshit. Mm -hmm. That's why. Yeah. I mean, if it, if it came to the choice then, Mike, if somebody burst into your house, uh, I'm assuming you've got family, and burst, some psychopath bursts into your house uh, with a stranger and says, you've got a choice, Mike, I'm either going to murder your family or you're going to stab this stranger, what would you do? Since you're asking me, yeah. uh, the Bible is clear that if a man doesn't look after his own family, especially his immediate family... Uh, in that sense, he is uh, worse than an unbeliever and has denied the faith. So in that situation, you're, you're willing to consider that in that situation you would commit murder of a, of, to protect your family? It wouldn't be murder, then. There's a difference. Yes, it would. If it's, How it's is that not innocent. murder? Uh, so are you, saying, are you saying that when the, uh, when the, uh, when a, uh, when capital, when, when, when capital punishment is imposed on, on, uh, on someone, that that is murder? Oh, I believe it is, yeah. Okay. I believe it is, too. Yeah. Well, that, now, now we're getting into the doctrine of liberalism, which is another doctrine in the philosophy. No, 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 don't sense. Yeah. But, but the question there isn't uh, how, there's no way that that's not murder. That person is not guilty of any crime. The person that you are murdering is the innocent person that someone else is holding captive. And you're the choice. The choice you have is to murder is that, that innocent person. that will murder your family or it will you have to stab the guy he's held hostage. Now, if you're saying that you will defend your family by stabbing the, the innocent victim because it is a sin not to defend your family, then, then you're by your own murderer. argument, you're already a murderer. Murder, murder, is, murder is not, does not equate with, uh, with the killing. Cannibalism doesn't equate with being forced to eat human flesh. Eating human flesh is cannibalism. Yeah, killing somebody is murder. <laughs> Killing someone innocent without any... Without their being guilty is murder. Yeah. But that's not true, though. It, it is. If somebody... If somebody if, so you're saying that it's okay to kill somebody who's innocent. So if, you, somebody, you if someone is killing my wife, yeah. and it comes down to either I kill him first... No, we're not he, asking about him. We're talking some maniac... Yes. ...who is not the person you are supposed to kill. Right. Gives you a perfect, gives you a five-year-old child and says, "You slit this kid's throat, or I kill your wife." What do you do? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't kill the child. No. So, but then you committed a sin because the Bible says if you don't protect your family, then then you've committed a sin. So, well, well, what, what, you could, what, what, in my particular case, it extrapolates to the supernatural because my wife goes to heaven, and I'm not killing a child. I'm not. That's not happening. Oh, so so it's actually all right for your family to be killed because they'll go to heaven. It's not so all right. It's, say that it isn't all right. It's not all right for me to kill a child. It's not all right. 
but it's all right for... But you, you were saying a moment ago that the Bible says that it's a sin if you don't protect your family. So which is it? You can't have both. Well, you can, because my, family, my family is protected by the, the, the salvation, by the, the, by, the, by, by, the bread and, by the bread and blood. Now, given that option, you've given me a very specific option. Given yeah. that option, my wife goes to heaven and beats me there. Well, she beats you. She 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 well, gets there she gets there before. Her, she arrives there. Before. <laughs> she arrives there sooner. <laughs> 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 yeah, if I was her. Okay, that was funny. I'll give you that. That one. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I've I've remained silent for a while, just just listening to what you're saying, and it seems to me, Mike, with all due respect, yes, the, the, the more hypothetical scenarios you're given, which are a true reflection of the exact analogy that you yourself have used in this particular article, and I've not, I've not gone out elsewhere besides. Every time you're, you're given no choice but to apply the same logic to your own argument, you, you have no choice but to resort to theology, to sort of say, oh, well, I wasn't going to use the Bible, but since you bring it up. And it's like you're tying yourself up in knots with something that when you're given a, a, an example, when you're given something to see, the, 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 what you're essentially arguing for is the logical fallacy. You then try and sort of backpedal out of it and say, oh, no, 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 in my particular case, because I'm a real Christian, that wouldn't really happen. And that isn't answering the question. You're not confronting your own um, hypothetical scenario. You're not confronting it from the, the point of view that you're asking other people to confront it from. You're just using a get-out-of-jail-free card. Jim, every example I've been given involved me killing somebody who's innocent. The example of cannibalism is somebody eating somebody. I don't think that I've backed myself into any corner whatsoever. Now, I want you guys to I want you guys to finally admit that cannibalism is okay. Come on, just do it. I want to ask you a question. <laughs> What's, how, is, is a person who's, if, if somebody's dead yes. uh, and you leave them to rot right. or you eat them out of necessity, an mm. absolute necessity, it does, is that person any less dead or more dead? If more, you do more that. or less in heaven. If Are they more or less in heaven in right. that situation? It just, it's just me. In uh, fact, wouldn't they possibly be looking yeah. down from heaven saying, I'm really glad that, so uh, that Mike ate, ate my leg and survived because I like Mike and I want Mike to survive. Well, the, the, maybe, the, God, maybe God supplied you with this uh, empty carcass that the soul has left to enable you to survive. How do you know that the, the, by ignoring the, the, the survival option available to you, that you're not actually ignoring the, what you would class as the supernatural miracle that would save you? I mean, aren't you in a weird way committing sort of suicide by inaction? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, what would you do if you, if you, if you died? If you, you, you sat there, you had a body there, you were sitting in the snow on the Andes, you had a body there that you could eat to survive, and that would give you enough time to survive, and you died, and hypothetically you rock on up at the gates of heaven, and you go in, and you go and talk to God, and you say, God, why didn't you send something to save me? And he goes... I left the corpses of a whole bunch of your mates there to eat. What were you thinking? What else do you want? Well, what would you do in that situation? Even, you even, want a bloody pizza? <laughs> even, even prior to being in that situation, sitting in my home, I'm already saved. So the question would not be, God, why didn't you save me? Uh, and uh, Saved from what, Mike? Uh, saved from, well, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, people who are born again have been adopted from what we call the family of Satan, okay, when everybody's born into that family, from that family, into the family of God, saved from an eternal existence apart from God. Now that happens, that is a, that is a, that, that is a true existence whether in this body or the next. Now, how many non-religious people believe in sin? Now, uh, I just want to finish answering Alex's question here, uh, Jim, uh, please. If, if, uh, if that's okay, uh, Alex asks, uh, "No, what happens? Uh, you know, why is it bad to eat people? God has given you the the, the rotting corpses of your friends to eat. Uh, well, there are many uh, health reasons why you shouldn't do that. Uh, yeah, but which is why we don't. Right, but, but which but, is why we wouldn't do it unless it was an absolute yeah, matter of survival. Right, right. So again, you've undermined your own argument. No, I hope you do. No, I haven't. About atheists being cannibals. You've, you've proved the point we were making. But Susan just but, said she would. Yeah, but we'd only do it under the absolute no other yeah, option. But you would still do it. You've already made yeah, up but, your mind. But, yes, I would like to go on living. Yeah. Well, life, and life, I, right, so, so essentially, you're going to die someday. Now, the Bible says, it's yeah. very, the Bible says that people 
were created on a day separate from animals in the image and likeness of God. People are not given as food. So when people eat people, they're doing so in, in a direct contradiction to the created order of things. But, you know, yeah, but people, that's, people that's, are no more... People are no more food than rocks that, are. Coming at this from the point of view that there's absolutely no truth to that story. Okay. Yeah, well, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't invite an atheist onto your show. You invited no. me. No, but I mean the thing is, like, I mean, you, 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 the argument you've made is, is built on extremely fragile foundations. I feel, and it's built on depending on certain things being true that that. Are demonstrably untrue. Okay. I mean, you're, you're claiming that you know that animals were, were formed on the uh, on a day separate from from man. I mean, the thing is, Genesis itself isn't particularly clear. It says that on you know in one version of it of the creation story, it says that man was created first, and then the animals were created, and man named them. Then another one is uh, you know that the animals were made first, and then man was made. It's, it's Genesis itself can't make its mind up. But the thing is. The important part of this is that the Genesis story is a myth. It's not true. It's demonstrably not true because the evidence around us absolutely screams that it's not true. Well, right the back at right back it. at you, Alex. The uh, the uh, the uh, theory the theory of uh, of uh, Darwinian evolution is demonstrably a myth and untrue. It's not. And, and I run the risk of I run the risk of sounding contrarian when I say that, but. The evidence is available at P.P. P. Simmons on YouTube, at uh, cre the Creation Ministries International run by Jonathan Sarfati, and at, uh, at, the, creation, at uh, the Institute for Creation Research. That's uh, ICR.com. It doesn't know what that evidence actually says. Yeah, because uh, last time I checked, we weren't an advert. We're actually trying to find out what you believe. So well, I'm not well, a, I'm not a scientist. I'm not uh, hang on, a uh, cat. I'm not a scientist. I didn't I didn't yeah. come here under the false pretenses of being a scientist. I came so, here to so, talk so about really, there's no scientific evidence at the address that you just given to disprove Darwinian Oh, at, at, at those at those evidences there are. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well give us an overview of that. Give us a what, sorry? Give an us an overview of what that evidence is. The, the evidence is primarily against deep time theology, that uh, that the universe is not as old as people think. And the, one of the primary examples was just from this week, from the tar sands of Canada. They're finding We not know what you're saying, it's evidence. <clears throat> we know what you're saying, it's evidence against. We want to know what that evidence is. Well, again, uh, the, the evidence comes stems from actual uh, scientific uh, discoveries, like, for example, the tar sands in Canada, like, for the third time. Are they in peer-reviewed journals? So what, what is the finding of that, of that evidence? Well, uh, is, you know what, the people at Nature Magazine are not my peers. Uh, you know, the word peer has a definite right. meaning. They're, they're, some of these peer-reviewed some of these peer-reviewed magazines are guilty of fraud in many cases. Is it, so is it true to say you haven't actually read this evidence against it? No, no, I've read it and and uh, and uh, I've looked into it myself. And they're pulling uh, they're pulling uh, actual bones up out of the tar sands that that uh, should be should be uh, either fossilized or non-existent because things don't fossilize in that kind of environment. These are bones that have flesh on them. And well, the same thing happens in peat bogs all the time. I mean, yeah. it, just because there's tissue found doesn't mean it's not an ancient specimen. Uh, has, there, has, there, has there been t tissue found on... Uh, uh, what kind of tissue lasts for millions, of, millions of years? But how do you know that these things are millions of years old? I thought well, they, that you didn't believe something. No, 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 I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying that there's no way that these, 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 uh, these articles that have been found are supposed millions of years. It's been suppressed that these are being found as actual tissue. That there's no way it could, even though it's been dated to millions of years, there's no possible way it could be. Well, I'm trying to find so, evidence of this. Well, it was suppressing it. It was suppressing. You may not find evidence of it. I mean, it's been suppressed, obviously, but. But no, you can go to. No, no, <laughs> listen, where listen. Did you find it? No, let, let me say, let me say this was actually. This was covered on a on a Canadian uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and they inadvertently stumbled into it and, and backed out of it. But uh, all of this all of this can be found at uh, at uh, the Institute for Creation Research at PP Simmons on YouTube. So the evidence for creationism can be found on a creationist website. Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> what what uh, what uh, what evidence what evidence for evolution can be found at atheist websites like uh, Pandora's Thumb and uh, and uh, you know et cetera et cetera. You know, when I, quite often when I when I when I, 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 when I,
scientists. scientists. There's quite a few scientists who are Christian, not Christian scientists. We're being yeah. very careful with this one. Yeah. Um, that, that do Perhaps falsely things. so called. Well, I think if. Enough with the true Scotsman fallacy. It's That's really not a real fallacy, Cat. That's not a true fallacy. <laughs> That's amazing. That's have you ever studied? The, have you ever studied the? Have you ever studied the history of the no true Scotsman fallacy? Yeah, I do understand the history of the no true Scotsman fallacy. That's not a real fallacy. It must be. It must be. That's a pseudo fallacy. It, it must be extremely difficult to keep this this these mental acrobatics going on in your head. I have to say, I've got to take my hat off to you for just. Uh, Sticking your heels in despite the vast amounts of evidence. Jim, all of this, all of this that I've, that I've said, you know, I, I'm not a scientist, but all of this stuff about the cannibalism and the tenets of atheism and, the, and the, the, the logic material is all in my book, The Atheists Are Wrong, available at ppsimmons.com. Please, please stop advertising on our, our uh, podcast because it's just, it, it's not that we don't care about your book, it's that it's terribly rude. And we will link to your work. And we website. always link yeah. to other people's work anyway. Thank yeah. you so it, much. It's just impolite to, to treat us as if we're, we're a paid show where, where you're paying for advertising. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I, 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 according to my uh, audio recorder here, and I'm recording this, uh, I've been talking to you for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I don't think, I'm not using this as a, as a launching pad to sell books. I, what I, what I, and I'm perfectly willing, I think I've shown that I'm willing to talk about what I, what I, what I believe that I have discovered to be true. Now, I, 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 I don't want to pretend to, to come off as somebody who knows, uh, who knows a great deal uh, about science. I'm not a scientist, but it's the word science. In Canada, science is public property. And so we take... What are you saved from, Mike? Sorry? What are you saved from? Well, you're saved from an existence apart from God. That's what you're saved from. You're saved. I out think of it's an existence apart from God. To be honest, so I don't really need to be saved from it. I'm actually really rooting for it. Yeah. Cats just walked away. Uh, why do you think it's important to chew yourself against um, other world views, other opinions, other evidence that might prove that you're wrong? Why do you think it's important to ignore the evidence? Well, there's an old saying, Jim. Uh, you're either at the table or you're on the table. I mean, if you don't if you don't come against uh, this uh, philosophy that's sweeping the, the world, the philosophy of naturalism, then look what happens. I mean, uh, the the uh, the philosophy has taken a root in, in schools, uh, c committing child abuse, teaching children that they're just animals made out of meat, and uh, there's no existential reality apart from nature. And uh, you know that if we don't stand up against that, then uh, it is our it is our view that uh, this is the primary reason why children are acting like animals today, is that they've been taught they, they're nothing but animals. And I think that... Uh, yeah, this is the thing. Yeah, I've seen you said this before, that you think the children are acting like animals today. Now, the evidence I've seen, I don't actually see any evidence of that. I don't see that things are actually any different than they had, than they were 50 years ago, 100 years ago, or whatever. I think there's, certain, there's always going to be a certain amount of people within a population that will act in uh, irresponsible or destructive ways. Well, 100 uh, years I, ago, pe children used to take guns to school and after school go hunting for dinner. And nowadays, if, if children take guns to school, it's for one reason, and that's to kill somebody else. I mean, look what, now, look what happened. A, it's, a, it's interesting that you mentioned guns, because on, on another one of your articles that I read, you, you claimed that the thing that, that would have prevented the uh, shootings in Norway would have been if everybody had had guns. Um, well, instead of just, you know, if you have, yeah. a, if you have a, a, a society where you have to be heavily licensed to get a weapon uh, versus a, a society where anybody can carry them, you're saying that you'd have fewer gun deaths with everybody who everybody carrying packing heat compared to people who don't. Now the thing is with that, and it, I know it's a little aside, but the the thing is with that, with the the shootings in Norway, that was a very uh, limited incident, and that was just one thing that happened. It was an awful thing that happened, but they don't. The reason it made the news so much was because it doesn't happen regularly in Norway because nobody has guns. Now in the USA, where everybody has guns. Uh, people are getting shot all the time, and it actually, sickeningly, doesn't make the news as much because it's become such a common occurrence. So that argument, I just wanted to point out that your your fallacious thinking isn't just limited to uh, claiming that atheists are, you know, cannibals and rapists and murderers. Uh, it also seems to extend it to other areas of your life. So it does make me wonder what causes that, and, uh, and is it the religion that's causing this sort of suppression of 
of the ability to think rationally. I'd, I'd like to, uh, a moment to respond to that, if I may. Okay, yeah. I've never said that you're rapists. I've never said that. I've never said that you're anything... Okay, well, let me say this to you. Yeah. If I was faced with a situation where everybody on earth would die unless I raped somebody, I would rape that person. It doesn't mean that I'd want to do it, but I would do it because it would save other people. Now, do you now change your opinion of me and say that I'm a rapist? If, if you would rape a woman, who, if you would rape right. a if you've already, now, you sound like you've already made up your mind that you would rape a woman, Okay. If it, if it was a choice between oh, doing that, it doesn't matter. Given the right, you're like the guy. You're like the the guy the guy who says, given the right set of circumstances, no matter how exaggerated they are, you would rape a woman. That makes you a rapist. I mean, let's be you're honest. Saying I know a rapist. You're, you're saying that there would be an appropriate set of circumstances as well because you're not get out of the court. Jim, the, Jim, would you, rapist. Jim, would you rape a woman? Would you rape a woman, Jim? You're coming just the same. You're you're basically playing the get out of jail free card. What I'm saying is that I think that it's a t high time people just admit to the truth here that if you would if you would kill if you would eat a, another person, you are a cannibal. I mean, why this is not no, so, you're such not. this is not you're such not an enigma. Until you eat another person, if you would rape a person, as Alex admitted he would, and I don't, I don't know, Jim, if you would, in that situation, Susan, Alex you may. Alex is not a rapist until he rapes somebody. Uh, he's already <laughs> made up his mind that. Okay, so you're saying that someone who has made up their mind that given the right set of circumstances, they would rape, they would rape somebody. They've already made up their mind they're going to do it. If these in circum extreme circumstances, if these extreme circumstances, though, that right? is a rapist. That's the truest definition of a rapist. I, I, have, well, actually, go on, I have a question. I have a very quick question. Yes. Okay, let's turn the, the hypothetical around slightly. Okay. Let's say that there was a case of 7 billion people, however many people are on the planet, would die. Or you allow, through your non-action, yourself to be sodomized. Would you uh, allow yourself to be sodomized? I have a 12-year-old that doesn't go to these extremes. I mean, these, these are, these are what-ifs. I'm serious. I'm sorry, but go ahead. It, it, it's, it's an analogous one to yours because through my inaction, yes. something would or would not happen. All right. So I, I, all right. You do, I, not, you do not resist. You allow yourself. Okay, allow yourself. Right. You are not raping someone, but you are not saying, "Okay, I'm going to say no and stop this person physically." Or, or seven people, seven billion people die. Is this the alien example where aliens come down, like Dan Barker said, and they're going to kill everyone? If or we'll go back to your your wife being killed. Yes. Let let me rape you, this hypothetical man creature. Let me rape you, yes. or I'll kill your wife. Let me fuck you. Oh, geez, that. We're not even going to use the word rape. Yeah, so, I mean, you're putting in a position there with, by the Bible's language, you're then classed as being homosexual. So, you have to either accept a homosexual act or uh, your wife is murdered. So, what do you do? Yeah, well, if my wife is murdered, uh, again, she, she, arrived, she arrives in heaven before me. Nobody's raping me. Okay, so you're a sociopath. Or an atheist child. How about that? The, so, uh, you, the, uh, go to heaven. The, uh, the, the Bible is clear that a man will not lay with a man. It's an abomination. So I'm not going to commit an abomination to keep my wife out of heaven. But the Bible is clear that it's a great sin to allow your family to come to harm. Well, th th there, are, there are greater sins than that, like murder. So, but, but aren't you by... But my, my, now, my wife, my, now, I don't see how my wife going to heaven before me is a great harm, though, actually. That's why I changed it. Let's leave your wife out of this. I, th I think what Alex kind of perfectly de describing to you, which you, you seem to be somewhat resistant to actually acknowledging, but is nevertheless self evident to everybody listening, is that there are so many contradictions in the Bible that it's completely futile to use it in places where you choose to use it. Now, all of these, all, Jim, Jim, wait a minute. I got to I got to call you to the carpet on that one. All of these so-called contradictions have been soundly refuted. There are many, uh, okay, many. You, you've just re-established another one of them. I have you not. How? In your own words, you have just re-established the fundamental contradiction of the Bible. How? You have said that you would disobey the teaching of the Bible because it was a lesser sin. Well, how, how, is, how, is, uh, how is allowing my wife to go to heaven before me not looking after her, though? So I'm not violating anything. 
you told you, you just said the Bible said that you have to protect your family. Well, no. If, I, that's, no. if that means letting your family die, why didn't you say that? Well, when it comes to a, a personal, when it comes, when, when, when it comes to, are you guys aware of the of the do no harm uh, re requisite in uh, in the medical field? I actually have the words do no harm tattooed on my wrist. Do, are you aware that there is a requisite... I'm actually a nurse, so yes. Are you aware that there is a requisite uh, greater, uh, that has greater weight than that? Come on. It's called, the, it's called, in Latin, it's called primum suceri. It means hasten to help. That is a, is a premise in the medical field that overrides the do no harm, because in many cases, when you do harm, in order to help, you, you have harm. to do harm. You right? may harm. Exactly. Right. That's, Go ahead. The, right. So, in the case of, of the examples you're giving, uh, harm is done to my wife in that she may go through uh, physical pain for a time, in which case I do no sin, she goes to heaven. Do you see how that works? Well, then now, in the, case of, in the case of, let's say, let's say you're standing, Susan, uh, do you have kids, Susan? I do not. Let's say someone has a child, a woman has a child. I do. She, sorry? Alex, I have children. You have children. So uh, let's say, Alex, you're standing at the kitchen doing the dishes, and you look out at the street, and your four-year-old has gotten out the front door, walking towards the street, and you look out, and, and just as the child is about to enter the street, you, you do some calculations in your head. You see that a car is coming, and you're figuring out, do I have enough time to run out there and grab him? You run out the door, you're chasing out after him, he's continuing to walk out into the street, the car is barreling down on him, you grab hold of him, you almost rip his arm off, throwing him out into the street, you've done your son great harm, but you saved his life. That is the, the prime example of primum sucerere. You've done harm to save a life, right? Now I am not... Sorry, go ahead. By taking action, you've, you've prevented further harm, so again, you've, you've ultimately done less harm because you've acted. Now, occasionally you're going to have to do a small amount of harm to, to save somebody from a greater... That is, greater is, surgery. Is, is, is hastening to help only applicable to it's, it's someone other than yourself? Well, what, no, 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 no. It, it, does, it does apply to me in so much as... Go on, let Jim speak. I'm sorry, Jim, Jim, I'm, Jim, I'm just getting little bits and pieces of Jim here. I'm sorry. It's interesting to know that, that, that no time in order to prevent serious injury to his hypothetical child, Alex didn't have to convert to Christianity or any sect of Christianity in order to take that action. He was capable of carrying out that perfectly good action without believing in things that aren't true. Well, I'll grant, it. I'll grant, I'll grant you that. This is true. This is the application of good, which is another transcendental reality. Uh, but given the, given the choice between... Uh, uh, you know, in the examples of killing someone in order to keep my wife from, from dying, uh, harm is done, but in the end, good prevails. That's the point of it all. Regardless of what you believe. Uh, well, and now you're, you're inserting, you're inserting an, uh, the, the transcendental reality of good into the situation. I'm willing to go there if you like. Okay. Kat had a question that she wants answering. Could you repeat the question, Kat? This whole hasten to help idea. Yes. Does it only work when you're dealing with another person? Are you only to hasten to help someone else? Is there no circumstance in, in which you should try to help yourself? Well, in, in helping yourself, I think you have to explain that. I mean, are you going to go to cannibalism where you're helping yourself to uh, violate the, uh, the tenets of, uh, of your faith to, uh, to keep your body alive when your body's going to die anyway eventually? So if, if, if you believe that all there is is nature, then I'm not surprised that there is a, a general admission that uh, cannibalism is, uh, is, uh, is an accepted behavior. I'm not surprised by that. We've never said it's an accepted behavior. Well, you said you would do it. There's a difference between each. Going, this would be a really great idea this weekend. I'm going to go kill a child and eat it. Yeah. You think about this conversation for the last one hour and 44 minutes, the same as we had in the classic case of you hearing what you want to hear. We've never said that at any time. We've spent an hour and a half telling you that that is not what we're saying. And at the end of that conversation, you still got away and believe in whatever you want to believe about was anywhere. Well, that, okay, so I, you know, may, maybe, maybe you're right that maybe you're right that we've exhausted this as much as we can. There's a couple of things because I think we 
we should draw things to a close there since sure. as, as time is running forward. There's a couple of things I want to come back to, and I'm just going to touch on them fairly briefly. Uh, you said that there's no contradictions in the Bible. I'm just going to present you with a couple of them. All right. uh, 2 Samuel 24, 1. Mm. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. 1 Chronicles 21, 1, reporting on the same incident. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So you've got two verses, one saying the Lord told, effectively moved David to number the people of Israel, and another one saying that Satan uh, moved David to number the people of Israel. Now that's a clear contradiction. Here's another one. Uh, 2 Kings 8.26, uh, it's back to King Ahaziah. Uh, in 2 Kings 8.26, he was 2 and 20 years old, was Ahaziah, when he began to reign. Yet if you read Chronicles 2.22, 2, verse 2, 40 and 2 years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. So there's a gap of 20 years there again. Now I've heard lots of excuses to try and get out of this, but if the Bible is the literal word of God, uh, and he has inspired all the translations down the ages to make sure that we get the exact right word of God, then there are clearly contradictions in it. And then he's made mistakes. Who cast John into the sea? John contradicts himself in 1, 15 and 2, 3. Where did John baptize? Matthew contradicts Mark. Uh, the list of contradictions in the Bible is literally endless. Well, I'm, I'm sure Some of them aren't a, a matter of interpretation. Sometimes they're just, here's a nice long list. Wouldn't it live long, Joel? 21.7 directly contradicts Psalm 55.23. How many children did Michael have, or Michael, yeah. the daughter of Saul, have? Therefore, the daughter of Saul had no child until the day of her death. Yes, so the king took the two sons of Rizpah, right. the daughter of Aea, um, whom she bore unto Saul, Armani and, uh, I can't even pronounce that name, yes. and the five sons of Michael and the daughter of Saul, whom she bought for Israel, the son of Barbazella, the man of thy. So she's got a whole bunch of, but that's just a few examples. Now, the other thing I wanted to come back to. Does wisdom make people happy? Proverbs 3.13 directly contradicts Ecclesiastes 1.18. So I mean, there's plenty of contradictions there, Mike, but the other thing I wanted to come back to, and I'm going to briefly touch on it because I know that it's something that we've done to death on this show. Uh, it's, you say that logic comes from uh, Christianity, and I just want to ask you a single question. How many times does the word logic appear in the Bible? Uh, the, the, uh, if, if I may speak on logic. If I may speak on the contradiction uh, okay, uh, issue, uh, that, that if, if, uh, you know, you've got my, uh, my, uh, my information now. Uh, if you want to, do, we could do a whole show on that. And uh, just send me your list, and I, I will refute every one of them. Okay, we may come back to that then. I mean, you know, because we quite a long show. We might do a series on that. But, uh, but, Sue, but the question remains, though, if you could tell me, you're saying that logic is, is found, you know, that atheists are borrowing from Christianity to use logic. I just want to know, how many times does the word itself, the word logic, appear in the Bible? Logic is a is a uh, is a synonym for wisdom given in the Bible. If you look through the That's a different thing, a different thing. Wisdom wisdom can be knowing a lot about Dungeons and Dragons. Wisdom can be knowing how to put a car engine together. It doesn't mean anything. No, that's knowledge. Wisdom, wisdom is okay. slightly different. I would okay. say yeah. the deep understanding and realization of people, things, events, or situations, resulting in the ability to apply perception, judgments, and actions. Well, well since since you since the, I'm sorry, Kat, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. No, that's just how it defines wisdom. Thank you, thank you. So, 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 uh, so wisdom uh, it can be can it may be uh, may be uh, used in many contexts. One of them is in, in the in the in the context of logic. If you go through the the Proverbs, for example, speaks of uh, wisdom many times, and that wisdom is required to as an a priori for life. And uh, okay. sorry, go ahead. No, no, go on. I mean, you're saying that so is wisdom something that ought to be sought. Well, is it, is, isn't logic something that should be sought? Well, logic's just something that we use to describe the reality around us. It's not something independent of it. When the, knowledge when, is something independent. Yeah. Well, right. Logic knowledge and wisdom are not synonymous, but when, a, when, a, uh, when an atheist... Now, now I, I'm going to plug my book again here, <laughs> because it does speak, go into great, great detail about uh, logic, how logic... Then just say, look at my book about it, please don't... Well, no, no, no I'm going to talk about it. I'm going, I'm going to talk about it, but... Um, okay. It's been an hour and 45 minutes now. I'm not sure how long because what I'm about to say is going to cause a flurry of comments against me. I understand that. Okay. When a, an atheist, a modern atheist, uh, uses logic, they're borrowing from God just like, just like, this is the analogy I use. 
A person goes into Walmart, they shop around for a couple of hours, then they leave. Two hours later, they uh, run into a friend, and the friend says, hey, I saw you at Walmart earlier. And the person says, there's no such thing as Walmart. Logic is, has a transcendental origin. So, when atheists use logic, they are borrowing from the transcendental reality they say does not exist, and then they say it does not exist. The same is true with good. I mean, morality is subjective. Morality, I mean, the cannibals in Africa, they, just like you guys have justified cannibalism morally. And I understand that. Oh, you're coming dangerously close to the tag again. Okay, you, you justified eating people morally. All right? Now, for me, that is morally unacceptable, but that's for me. However, good is universally applicable. Good, now you may say it's okay for, for, uh, for someone to rape a woman saving seven million people, or billion people. That may be morally acceptable to a person, but it could never be argued that it's good. You're doing something that's not good in order to have an end result that you morally accept. But as Mike, good. Yeah. Mike, it's not morally acceptable either, but if you're given the choice and that's the only choice you've got, if I was put in that situation and I had to commit that act to save everybody else on earth, I would gladly take the punishment for having done what I'd done, knowing that I had done what was the right well, thing. It's like it's doing wrong to do good. I would steal a loaf of bread to feed my family. All right, well, I'm just saying that even though it's morally wrong, and I don't right. think that stealing is right, but if it comes right down to it, I'm stealing the bread. Right. Wait, can I can I advise you to read a book by Sam Harris called The Moral Landscape? Yeah, I'm familiar with Sam Harris. I won't be reading his book. Uh, the the uh, the morality yeah, issue. The mor wait a minute, Jim. Jim, I would probably agree with uh, Sam on that. The uh, morality issue is settled for me. I believe that morality is subjective. I do. No, you no, you believe morality is, is about absolutes. A what? Sorry. You believe in absolutes. No, no, I don't believe morality is absolute. I believe good is absolute. That... <laughs> uh, that's okay. 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 Now wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me let me uh, let me uh, let me elaborate on that. Let's say we have uh, tribes in Africa doing things that are not good. They're you know clitorectomies and so on and so forth. The United Nations goes in. Now they, this tribe they believe this is a good thing to do. The the Muslims or whatever. You know. They, they believe this is good and moral. Now, the world community, they learn about this on Yahoo News, and they get into an outrage. This is not acceptable. This is not good. Because good, no matter what people think is morally acceptable, good is transcendental. It's universally acceptable, or uh, universally applicable. And when something is an a priority, it exists outside of the topic. And since we're talking about the entire universe, the, the a priori exists outside of the universe, now, 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 I want Jim to tell me where he last saw his logic tree. They carry out those insidious acts, believe in things that aren't true. They're not doing them because they're good or because they believe that they're good. They're doing them because they believe in things that aren't true. They are following a doctrine which is false. Well, they, they believe their doctrine is good. They believe it's moral. When, well, when, when, the, when the world says, no, this is not good, you shouldn't be doing this, and we're going to stop you from doing it because it's not good. Good is a universally acceptable uh, reality. That, and since it's an a priori for everything in the universe, it must exist outside the universe. Mike, Mike you've just made the perfect argument against your own argument. Mm -hmm. Those people believe that it is the right thing to do because they are told to do it by their particular holy books. Right. Yep. No, no, no I, agree, I agree totally. I, I, and, you know, it makes the argument, it makes the case that all religion is evil. It makes that case. It doesn't contradict me. I say that these things and may be... You can't define God without using scripture. These things, well, I'm a born-again Christian. That's, this is my holy book, and I believe that uh, all of your contradictions that you outlined are, have been uh, du duly refuted, and uh, I'm willing to come back maybe in a week or two and do a show on it. So every religion other than yours is wrong, is that correct? I think all religions are wrong. All of them. So different, but without using scripture? Well, my, scripture is, uh, is uh, you know, it's uh, basic instructions before leaving earth. It's not a religious... Uh, a duty to know and follow the, the scriptures, you know, the so people... Do you, Mike, are you basically saying here that you don't think Christianity is a religion? The Christianity is like Australia. It's an, it's an existential paradox. Australia exists as... Hey, what? It's a, a religion. I'm going to call bullshit on that. that no, no, right. well, sense. okay. No. Is, religion, is Christianity a religion, yes or no? Christianity is an existential paradox. Now, if, is I don't know, Christianity a religion? Do yes. you want me to explain that? No, I want you to give me a straight answer. 
in the form of yes or no. Okay, let me ask you. It's going to be one or the other. Well, I know it may not be proper etiquette to answer a question with a question, but think about Australia. What is Australia? Australia is a continent. What else is it? What else is it? It's a pile of rock. What is Australia? Now, Alex, you're an intelligent person. What is Australia? It's two things. Go it's on. a land mass and it's a Australia country. is a continent and a country. It yeah. exists as a continent at the same time as it exists as a country. It's an existential paradox. You can talk about Australia. At, oh, you so can go. How is that an existential paradox? Hang on a minute. Well, you guys can look that up in the dictionary later. But think about Mike, this. Mike, Aus- Mike. Hang on. Now, let me finish my point, Jim. Mike. Australia, you can go to an encyclopedia and look up all the facts about Australia as it exists as a continent, right? That it's the, the smallest of seven, and yada, yada, yada. And then you can go and look up Australia as it exists as a country. It's land mass, and it's geology, and so on and so forth. Christianity is much like that. Christianity exists as a religion, like fire insurance, like I said earlier. People embrace the, the, uh, the tenets and the philosophies that surround it in Christianity, but they never know God. But... Christianity also exists. So, 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 Hang on, Jim. Them. Hang on, Jim. Mike, Christianity Mike, also Mike, exists. Mike, 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 okay. Mike, Mike, oh, go ahead and interrupt Mike, me there, Jim. Stop. Stop, stop talking for a second. Mike, please yeah. stop. Define God without using Christian theology. Christianity exists also as a Define relationship. Without using Christian theology. God is the creator of the universe. He exists outside. He exists. He exists. In your first sentence. Goodbye. I, I'm trying to explain this to you. Uh, God, God is the creator of God is the creator of the universe as it exists in time space. And how do you know that? Because I know Him. And how do you know Him? Well, this speaks to the second uh, Christianity as it exists, and this so is. So you are using Christianity in order to define your, your particular. Christianity definition. exists as a relationship, and that is the that is the. Uh, uh, the, uh, the existential reality of Christianity that God accepts. He doesn't accept the religious uh, uh, adherence. He doesn't accept that. God hates religion. So are we happy to accept that you can't define God without resolving to Christian theology? Well, I know God, you know, the, the Bible is the road map through... through so, uh, so that's a... Okay, great. I think on that, that is probably a good place to draw things to a close. It's coming up to two hours now, and it is... Going to be you know, for the listeners that have stuck with us throughout uh, when they download the podcast. I think. I against the fact that Christianity isn't a religion and a religion at the same time. Yeah. It's a religion That's and a relationship, Jim. I think that you haven't got you haven't got a clear grasp of what I was saying because you tried interrupting me. You would have no, done no, yourself. No, I was interrupting you because you weren't listening to a single word that I was trying to say to you, Mike. But Jim, uh, you, Jim, 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 Jim. We're the ones who eat other human beings and commit rape without care for the fact that it's the wrong. You can't set out basic premise of your initial truth claim that God exists. Jim, Jim, you can't God without resolving something you yourself have admitted is circular in nature. Jim, I was asked to come here and discuss a certain topic, uh, and if I ever interrupted you, it's because of the, uh, the uh, communication uh, disruption here. Nice. And, and, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I've had a good time here, and I appreciate the conversation, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you I'm all... Sorry. Done a good job of standing up against uh, four people against one, but uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say that you just you haven't explained anything at all with any clarity. Well, we'll let, we'll, let, we'll, let, uh, we'll let the, adi- the audience uh, decide that. And, and Alex, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. And, uh, and I, I, I will, I will, I will uh, end it by saying this, that uh, I would uh, certainly consider doing this again. And I feel like I have been treated with respect uh, 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 for, for the most part. And uh, I will look forward to the podcast uh, uh, later on today. Uh, Mike, Mike. Go on, Susan. I'm sorry. I just wanted to mention one thing to him uh, before... Before he goes, I am familiar with P.P. Simmons. I, I, I have seen some of the uh, creationist uh, explanations and videos on there, and and through that, uh, through refutation of that, I learned about a, a, a guy on on YouTube uh, goes by the handle of the Living Dinosaur, mm-hmm. and he has pretty much destroyed every single one of them. If you really are interested in learning from a scientist about what evolution is, I strongly recommend that you view some of his Holy Hallucinations videos. There is a little bit of bad language in there, but 
I can tell you, it's very enlightening. We, we've been okay. asked to we've been asked to refute uh, the living dinosaur. We've gone through some of his material, and unfortunately, uh, he does himself great disservice by uh, by using the the kind of profanity that he does. And uh, so we we no no. Our, our, well, let me let me say that our our refutation, the PP Simmons Ministry refutation, is the content of our videos. And so, uh, and then now look for Carl Gallup's book coming out, The Magic Man in the Sky. You're going to find that very interesting. And, uh, Mike? Yes. Mike, if you want to point some of your uh, pod readers towards somebody who doesn't use bad language in his refutation, please do. Please do. He uses a on YouTube called Aaron Ra, A R O N R A. And he has done a series of um, uh, foundational falsehoods of creationism, yes. which absolutely blows out of the water all of this discovery. Uh, uh, nonsense that's coming out of places like um, what they call again the Discovery Institute. Yeah, yeah. It absolutely yeah. refutes point by point each and every one of the creationist arguments. Yeah, we, 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 we are, we are, so, yeah, sorry, Jim. Whether or not there's an answer to some of your propositions, go and watch them right now. It's right in front of you. It's called YouTube. Everybody knows how to find it. Everybody knows how to search it. Alan Ra will go through point by point of every single one of the things that you've said. We've looked at Aaron Ross' uh, material, and uh, we are we are going to be getting into refuting some of that. Uh, we've done some stuff on uh, on uh, Thunderfoot, and um, so we 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 are interested. We are in and being on the podcast. We are interested in doing that. Thank you so much, guys. And uh, so, are we done now? Okay. Well, I, well, I just like to say before we finish, uh, Mike, I do appreciate you coming on. I, I appreciate you staying. I have to say, you've you've. Uh, you'll be glad to know uh, you've certainly outlasted uh, Steve Drain from Westbrook Baptist Church. Who <laughs> what? After about forty-five minutes. Uh, you know, I'm, so, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry for. I'm sorry for that. I, I, he, he, we, we don't. Uh, <laughs> all right, go ahead. No, you, you, did, you did. You did very well. You, you've outlasted Steve Drain. So uh -huh. I think fair play to you on that. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining in. Uh, I know that the debate has got a little bit heated at times, but that's how these things go. Uh, I guess all that's left to say is, uh, yeah, thank you for listening.